Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. I want to do another video. This will be video number two on my series called the Authorised Version, or as they say in the States, the King James Version Bible. And uh, I managed to find the little book that I couldn't find just before, and it's called The Book of Books, um, The Book of Books by Melvin Bragg. Now Melvin Bragg I don't think is a Christian necessarily, but I do believe that he wrote an exceptional um, history of the radical impact of the King James Bible 1611 to 2011 okay so that's Melvin Bragg he's one of my favorite authors and one of my favorite historians so his his book is exceptionally good it's got pictures I'll show you the pictures as we go and I've also got my original um, copy my facsimile of the King James Bible which I treasure very much and I've also got the book that I'm going to be reviewing first, which is um, In the Beginning by uh, Alastair McGrath. Now, <clears throat> I want to say something a little bit before we start. This is the King James Bible has been my favourite Bible all my life. I am exceptionally familiar with it. I can speak it easily. I can get my tongue around all the difficult words generally. And it just flows out of my mind. It's the it's the King James Bible when I was young was all that we basically had. There were a few other translations that popped up like the RSV um, and there were lots of and then eventually the NIV. But the main thing is that the King James Bible is what I was brought up on. So I am very familiar with it. The language and the diction and the, the words and the sentence structure is what's called the King's English. If you want to know how to speak English correctly, then you must familiarise yourself with what's called the King's English. And you'll find the King's English in a copy of the King James Bible. OK, now <clears throat> I'm going to read the preface to this, this little book here. But before I do, I want to just um, see who has got the answer to my question. OK, the question of how many words there were in the first verse of the King James Bible in Matthew chapter one, verse one. Now I'm going to let you know in the King James Bible, there are 16 and sometimes 17 words. That's quite a lot, isn't it? But I want to reveal something to you which might surprise you in the original Greek manuscripts. As far as we're able to determine, there were only eight words, just eight. OK, and the way the Greek reads is like this. I won't read it for you in the Greek words. I'll just give the English translation of each word uh, in the Greek. It reads. The book, sorry, book, genealogy, Jesus Christ, son David, son, Abraham. So what Matthew actually wrote was not the King James Bible. What Matthew actually wrote were eight words. But those of you that um, have looked at your King James Version, you're going to find there's an awful lot more words. In fact, there's twice as many and sometimes more than twice as many words in the King James Bible that were ever written by Matthew. Now you say, why is that? That's because when the English translation of the King James Bible was being revised, because it was a revision, they wanted it not only to sound nice, but they wanted it to have a nice rhythm. They wanted the language to have a flow. And so they had a habit of putting in extra words that would make it flow in English. And so in English, that verse says, um, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's 16 or 17 words. Just some, some translations just have an extra word in there. But the important thing is this, is that when we're reading the Bible, we need to remember it was never given to us in English was never given in English. The New Testament is never given in English. The English is not the translation. Sorry, English is not the, the scriptures as we had them given to us by the apostles. 
what we have in English is a translation of what was given to us in Greek. Okay, and it's, it's a lot of people complain and say, oh, look, this, this, this version has, has taken words out. Let me just say something. The King James revisers were in the habit of putting words in. And so when modern translators come and they look at the original documents and they realize that the, some of these words were never there in the original documents, then you can't blame them if they're going to miss them out. Because they're not so much interested in the um, sanctity of the King James Bible. They're interested in the accuracy of the translation that they're giving us. Okay, and there was another thing that used to happen with the translators of the King James Bible is that they often <clears throat> would put in other phrases that were sometimes of a dubious nature. They would put in sometimes a whole paragraph, which in many of the original translations, uh, sorry, many of the original handwritten documents, as far as we're able to tell, were just missing. They were just not there. So the question is really this, is what is it that the Lord has given to us? Has he given to us a modern translation? Now, the authorised version was a modern translation in 1611. Has God given to us a modern translation? No, no, he hasn't. The Bible was never written originally in English. What the Lord gave to us through the apostles is a Greek text. OK, he gave us a Greek text, but he gave us a Greek text which had the theology of the Hebrews. So it had the ideas and the idioms of the Hebrews. It had the theology of the Hebrews, but it was given to us in a Greek text. And it wasn't given to us in classical Greek. It was given to us in Koine Greek, which means it was the Greek that was spoken in the street by the ordinary person. Okay, that is what the, the, the New Testament is that God has given us. Now, we don't speak Koine Greek. There's nobody that speaks Koine Greek today, except those people that have taken the time to learn it, but they don't speak it in everyday language. They just speak it and read it to the best of their ability in the Greek of the New Testament text. Okay, now I want to read this preface. You're going to find this very interesting. It's beautifully said. Um, it's a little bit overstated, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So what Alistair McGrath says, he says, I was born in 1953, the year of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Like every child born in Britain that year, I was given a copy of the Bible by command of the Queen. And as a child, I often pored over the book, puzzled by its old fashioned language. Uh, yet intrigued by the stories it told, it was a copy of the translation translation published in 1611, often referred to as the authorised version, but more widely known as the King James Bible, after the King of England who ordered it to be produced. As I grew older, I often wondered how the whole thing had come about. And how was the translation process started? And who were the people who created it? And what issues did they face? How did they go about producing this translation? And how was it received? And why had Elizabeth II asked for this specific version of the Bible to be given to all that were born in the year of her coronation? What was so special about it? Um, as the years passed, the Bible I'd been given as a child gradually fell to pieces. Its pages dropped out one by one and eventually it had to be thrown away. But the questions that puzzled me remained with me. And finally, half a century after being given that book, I came to a decision. I would investigate the origins of the King James Bible and tell the story of what I know, what I now knew, to be a literary and religious classic. This book tells that tale, set against the background of the tumultuous century of events that brought it into being. And I hope you enjoy reading it 
as much as I have enjoyed telling it. And then he says, Alastair McGrath, Oxford, June 2000. So this is a book written 22 years ago, but it is beautifully said and beautifully written. Now, occasionally, Alastair is a little bit over, um, uh, what's it, enthusiastic in his praise of the King James Bible. But there's nothing wrong with being enthusiastic about the King James Bible. I love the King James Bible. I'm exceptionally familiar with it. When I was a young boy, I used to get up with my brother and we would read the Bible together, sometimes 10 or 50, uh, on one occasion, at least one occasion, but perhaps many times, we read 50 chapters. 50 chapters. It takes a while, you know, to read 50 chapters. But this became absolutely ingrained in my skin. The King James Bible ingrained in my skin. However, I will say this. <clears throat> That the reason why I use the King James Bible today is for another reason. You see, in time I became a publisher of uh, books. I became a writer in my own right. And especially I became a, um, a publisher of, of Bible teaching, which has, has up until the present day has covered every book and every chapter and every verse in the whole Bible. Now then. I needed a Bible on my computer that I would be able to then take that scripture and put my thoughts alongside it. And the only Bible that I could find in those days that was available to me was the King James Bible. And so that is why I use the King James Bible uh, in my teaching. I use it unashamedly. I find it, I can speak it easily. I can understand it easily. And so I use it. There's a second reason why I use the King James Bible. And that is that all of the reference books that I would wish to turn to, like concordances, dictionaries, uh, lexicons, they all link to the King James Bible. So for me, it's a no brainer. I just stay with the King James Bible. All of my reference books attached to it. And I'm happy and I'm able to study like that. It's not necessarily my favourite translation. In fact, if you want to know what my favourite translation is, it's this one. Let me just one minute. So here is an English Revised Version. The English Revised Version. Okay. Okay. The English Revised Version of 1881. Now, it is a revision of the Authorised Version. Okay, it's a revision of the Authorised Version. Um, it has full references, that is, all technical references in related to the Greek uh, language and also to cross-referencing. And the important thing about it is, it is exceptionally accurate. It's, ex it's based upon the Authorised Version. However, it has... All of the idiosyncrasies and all of the minor mistakes of the text of the authorization corrected. And so that's the one that I used. For many years, you know, I used to go to a Bible study group and we had an exceptionally gifted Greek scholar that was with us in that. And often he would say, oh, well, when we're looking at this particular phrase, we need to understand that originally it said this. And I looked down at my... English Revised Version, and that is what it actually said. And so over time, I began to realize that if I needed to have an exceptionally accurate translation of the New Testament, I would need to come away from the Authorized Version and use the English Revised Version. Anyway, that's it. So we're going to catch up with you on our next video. We're looking forward to doing that. We're going to plunge deeper and deeper and deeper into the story of how the King James Bible um, happened to be written. All the people involved, all the circumstances, all of the theology that they believed in. It's going to be a fascinating journey. By the way, if you will, please like if you like this video and please subscribe. That helps us a great deal on our YouTube channel. And have a great day, everybody. Bye for now.